Nearly, I think it was around 18 years ago, as I was transitioning from Birmingham, Alabama, and praying and planning and thinking about moving to Lexington, Kentucky, I was contacted by one of the churches that I grew up uh, in, in Chapel Hill, Tennessee. And they contacted me. They knew that I was thinking about what my future was going to look like, if I was going to move to Lexington, what I was going to do. And they asked if I would come be the pastor of that church. Now, this was the church that was directly across the street from my grandparents' house, right across the road. This was the church that my granddad would pull me in a little red wagon to church every Sunday. And he would pull in like I was parking backwards into the uh, parking spot on the sidewalk there. And my little red wagon would be waiting for me after church. And I would get in and he would pull me back across the street. And this is a church that I love dearly. A lot of uh, significant spiritual moments happened in my life in this church. And so... There was a quick moment where I thought that would be amazing to move back to my hometown, uh, raise my kids where I grew up. Um, it, was, it was actually a growing area. It's about 45 minutes south of Nashville and it's growing toward Nashville. It's, uh, the church has actually grown significantly since this time. I would be close to friends and family. And as quick as I had all of those thoughts, my thoughts quickly transitioned to how difficult it would be to be the pastor of my grandparents. How difficult they are godly people, but I don't want to be their pastor. I'll put it that way. Now, this was the church where I think I've told this story where in the middle of a worship service, I think I was three years old. I had a cousin next to me and he said stand up and yell last call for alcohol and so the preacher was preaching and i stood up in the pew and yelled that out and and i i immediately thought about that moment all of those people in that church remember that moment and every time i see them they tell that story do you remember the time you yelled last call for alcohol And I said, yeah, because I experienced church discipline on that day, I was taken out back. And some of you know what that means. But but I began to think about my grandparents, all of these people that I grew up with, teachers, parents of close friends who are in that church. And I began to think, what if that didn't work out? And I called one of my mentors and he said, Jeremy, as, as great as that sounds, right or wrong, You just got to know it's really hard to pastor people who changed your diaper in the nursery. It it just doesn't usually work out well. When we get to our passage today, Jesus is kind of experiencing the same thing. As he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth, this small town where everybody knows everybody And everybody knows everything about everybody that they've ever done. This is where Jesus goes as he is leading his disciples, as they are doing ministry together. They are proclaiming the gospel. They end up in Nazareth. And in our passage today, this is his second time in his hometown. But what Mark does for us today is he paints a picture of how scary it is to be from Nazareth And to grow up with Jesus and yet to not know who Jesus is in flesh and blood. He paints a picture for us today of how scary unbelief really is. Notice verse 1. He went away. And last week we talked about the woman who Jesus healed of this, this horrible condition that had plagued her for 12 years. And immediately Jesus healed her. We talked about the 12 year old girl that Jesus literally raised from the dead. And Jesus moves on from those places. And the text says he went away. And remember, Mark does this so often. He jars us from one scene to the next. Jesus did these amazing things and then he went away. He moves away. And that's significant in our passage today. Notice he says he went away from there and came to his hometown 
And his disciples followed him. He wants to emphasize his disciples continue to follow him from episode to episode, scene to scene, town to town. The disciples are loyally following Jesus. But Nazareth was a very small town, probably 10 acres in size. There were no more than 400 people who lived in Nazareth. This would have been a small town on a hill headed to nowhere. Um, Jordan read the scripture today, so think about Jackson County. That's what Nazareth would look like. This was Jesus' home town. Nazareth was never mentioned in the Old Testament, and it is rarely ever mentioned by any church historians. It was extremely insignificant. And we know Jesus' first visit to Nazareth, what happened. Remember, he stood in the synagogue and he read from the scrolls of the kingdom that was coming. And he looked and said, today, this is fulfilled in your presence. The kingdom is here in flesh and blood. And they didn't receive him well. No, they tried to kill him. His hometown folks tried to kill him for declaring that the kingdom was at hand in his person. And so he goes back. And notice verse 2, on the Sabbath... He began to teach in the synagogue and notice what happens. And many who heard him were astonished. Now, the word astonished, it means to strike hard. It means to deliver a significant blow. It is intense. And so what goes on when Jesus preaches the word in the synagogue? Literally, people's minds are blown. They are struck. They are amazed that they, they, they can't get over his power as he preaches the word of God. And notice they ask the question, where did this man get these things? Where did he come up with this stuff? And what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? So Jesus preaches or, or reads the scripture And then interprets the scripture in the synagogue. And this happened every Sabbath. The rabbis would get up and they would read a portion of scripture. And then they would give their interpretation of the scripture. And most of the time it fell within certain traditions. But all of a sudden you have the scriptures in flesh standing before you. And Jesus isn't an expert rabbi on the word. He is the word. He's talking about himself. And so the way he taught the scriptures carved through tradition, there is something different here today. There is someone different here today. Where did he get these things? How does he come up with this stuff? And notice as he is performing mighty works. We know as he declared the the kingdom was at hand, what Jesus would often do is heal the sick. He would perform miracles. The lame would walk. The blind would see. He would cast out demons as he declared the kingdom is at hand. And what Jesus is saying is God's kingdom is at hand in my flesh and blood. What does God's kingdom look like? Well, here's a window. Imagine this sick person over here who is healed of their disease. Imagine this person over here who cannot see. Imagine this person who is blind. All of a sudden they can see. Look through this window into my kingdom. Look at this picture into my kingdom. And he would speak and the kingdom would be present in their flesh. And they would walk and they would see. And demons would leave bodies. He's saying, look at the kingdom. Look at the kingdom. Look into these windows of the kingdom all around you. What if the power of God came down right now? Well, it's here in my flesh. And as he did these things, people said, what in the world is going on? What what, what is who mentored him? Who taught him how to do all of these magic tricks? Notice verse three. Is not this the carpenter now? They are amazed at everything Jesus is doing. They are amazed at his skill to teach and his power to perform miracles until they remember, oh, yeah, that's Joseph's adopted boy. It's amazing. They're standing back. What in the world is going on? 
And then their amazement leaves them as they realize that's Joseph's boy. That's the boy Joseph raised. Isn't he a carpenter? Now, the word carpenter, it just means to work with your hands, to build things out of brick or wood. It meant to be common or earthly. Now, a lot of times we think about Joseph as a carpenter and we think, oh, he built these beautiful cabinets. He built this beautiful furniture, all the pictures of Joseph and Jesus working in the wood shop. Probably what Joseph did is he built a lot of farm equipment. He built a lot of yokes and plows. And so Jesus was known as someone who was very earthy, common. And people are standing around and saying, there is no way this man was trained in the scriptures. There is no way he was trained to tell us the things he's telling us to do. And the, the, the things he's telling us to believe. He, he's not elite. He didn't go to seminary. He went to tech school. So how in the world is he here in our synagogue preaching so powerfully and doing these things? And notice, isn't he the son of Mary? Now, this would have been insulting. Notice Joseph's name's not even mentioned. This would have been insulting and slanderous. You always use the father's name in identifying someone. But this also alludes to the rumors. Isn't he Mary's son? Oh, yeah. Y'all remember that story? That virgin birth stuff that they they tried to sell us when he was born. Y'all remember that? You see, this is an allusion to the fact that he the people thought he was illegitimate. This was slanderous to Jesus. And notice they mention his brother James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. Now we know James and we know Jude. We don't know much about these other two men. And then they just say, aren't his sisters here with us? So Jesus was a part of a family that everybody knew. They're amazed by his teaching. They're amazed by his power. But then they say, we know his mom and them. How how in the world is he doing that? This can't be real. This can't be right. We know all of these folks. And to be honest with you, they have a weird story behind all of this that they don't like to talk about. This is an odd bunch of people. And, And he's claiming to have this supernatural power. And he's claiming that the kingdom is at hand in his person. This is all weird. That He doesn't come from a, a line of rabbis or intellects. Nothing special about them. And notice what it leads to. They took offense at him. As this kind of builds in the community, as they be kind of murmur about Jesus, they are offended by him. Now, the word offend means to be tripped. And it means to stumble. There was something about Jesus that caused them to stumble. There were reasons why they would not believe in him that offended them. And we know that the scripture teaches us that Jesus is the cornerstone. The kingdom will be built upon him. But this cornerstone will call many cause many to stumble and fall and it will crush them in their rejection. But what we see here first is that unbelief is personal. They are offended by a person. They're not offended by generic interpretation and tradition. They're offended by flesh and blood standing before them that they can't make sense out of. That's what offends them, that the kingdom would come in flesh and blood that looks a lot like them. Remember, Jesus was a Nazarene. Nazareth had music. Nazareth had traditions. Nazareth had a whole culture that surrounded this this town that Jesus immersed himself in. And while Jesus is revealed to us in the pages of Scripture, Jesus is a flesh and blood person. And that is where unbelief comes in here. They're offended by a person. You see, one thing unbelief tries to do is make the gospel about something other than the person of Jesus Christ. Have you ever been around people who try to depersonalize the gospel? You know, if I can make this about just a debate over worldviews and different nuances of religion, then I really don't have to buy into it. I can keep it in theory, in concept. If I can make this about a theological debate, I know you're trying to share the gospel with me, 
But what does your church believe about tongues? Do y'all speak in tongues? Well, what about evolution? What do you believe about evolution? What kind of style of worship do you have? And so often we will be talking to unbelievers. And maybe you're here today and that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to make the gospel about something other than the person of Jesus Christ. And you've been evaluating our worship style. You've been evaluating the things that we do and how we say things as, as, as a church as we seek to worship Jesus. And you have forgotten this is all about a person. And you don't see it's all about a person. You see, if you can depersonalize the gospel, then you can put the book down. You can scroll through the Facebook post. You can leave the debate and it demands nothing of you. But what we say here today is Jesus is a person. And he's a person back from the dead. And he has earlobes. And he has cuticles on his fingernails. And he's a real person. And you will see this person. And so don't make it about anything else but the person of Jesus Christ revealed in Scripture. Will you submit to Him? Will you believe that He died for your sin? That He is perfect and you're not? And He is your only hope of salvation? Will you believe in Him? Will you only believe in Him today if you come to terms with what about Jesus offends you? Think about that. What is it about Jesus that offends you? Are there truths in Scripture that just kind of they don't set well with you. You know it's in the Word of God, but mm, I don't like that part about the Bible. I don't like that part about Jesus. You know, that says something about you. Because God sent Jesus as the revelation of Himself that is to declare to us who we are. And so maybe you're here today and you're offended by Jesus' goodness, that He is perfect, that He is righteous. You know why that trips you up is because for you to say that Jesus is the only good one, you have to say, I'm not good and I'm not good enough. Maybe you're here today and, and, and the, the, the thought that Jesus is Lord back from the dead. He has defeated sin and death. He is Lord. Maybe that's what offends you. Why does that offend you? Because if you say he's Lord, you have to submit to him and you have to follow him. Maybe it offends you that Jesus knows all things. Maybe it offends you that Jesus is in control of all things. Why does that offend you? Because you have to admit, I don't know all things and I'm not in control of all things. Maybe it offends you today that we are saying Jesus is king. Jesus is ruler. He is God's king and all history will be evaluated in light of him. Maybe that offends you. Why? Because you will have to stand before him. And be evaluated in light of him. And so don't don't trip up today. Don't stumble over the things about Jesus that offend you. No, stop. Stop and say, I will bow to the one God has sent. I will trust. I will believe. I will believe in the one God has sent in flesh and blood. I will follow this person according to the scriptures. I will give my life over to a person whose name is Jesus. Notice verse 4. Jesus explains to them. He said, a prophet is not without honor. And so there are prophets that are honorable. They're famous. They receive praise and acceptance as the word from the Lord. This does happen, except Jesus says, except in his hometown. And he's referring to himself. He said, you guys have seen the crowds follow us. You've seen my fame. You've seen my celebrity status. And yet we get to Nazareth and it ain't happening here, is it? We've been here twice. These people are seething in anger toward me. They're confused. There's gossip. There's slander throughout the town. Except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Remember, Jesus, even the brothers and sisters that we mentioned earlier said he's a fool until the resurrection, until he's back from the dead. They would say he is a crazy man talking this stuff. He's lost his mind. But notice verse five. And he could do no mighty work there. This isn't saying he was unable to. He chooses not to do a mighty work. We have seen 
the, the, the works, the, the miracles in the passages before, the, the healing of the sick, the raising the dead. Jesus chooses to do none of that, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. It was minuscule what he did in this town. But notice verse six. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Think about that. There's only two things that are described as causing Jesus to marvel and to be astonished. In one place, in Matthew and Luke, he is amazed at the faith of a centurion. He stands back amazed at this man's faith. And then here, he is amazed. He marvels at their unbelief. The, the Savior of the world is struck that his hometown folks can't see it. The people he knows the best changed his diaper in the nursery. And they don't see it. He, it, it, it blows his mind. He, he's aghast. He's amazed. The word means to wonder. It means to be astonished. It means to see something you, you just can't explain. Jesus marvels because of their unbelief. And notice what he does. And he went about among the villages teaching. He left there. They rejected the word. They rejected the kingdom. So he takes the kingdom elsewhere. They marvel at his skill. He marvels at their unbelief. They marvel at his teaching. He stands back amazed that they don't believe it. And I wonder today as you read those words, does unbelief shock you? Are you shocked when you share the gospel with someone, when you know someone who who has heard the gospel and they reject it? Does that shock you? Or are we just at a point where we sort of yawn and say, well, yeah, that's just that's just the way it is. Or does it does it ever jar you? Man, they 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 don't believe to watch someone forfeit the kingdom should be earth shattering. It, it shakes Jesus to watch someone choose alienation from God. I, I still it's, it's gut wrenching for me. When I'm talking to someone about the scriptures or the gospel and we get to a point where they look at me and they just go, yeah, I, yeah, I don't I, I can't argue with that. I can't. Yeah. OK, that makes sense. And then they still don't believe it. Like it, I don't understand that. I don't I don't get that. I used to think, well, I, maybe I'm not sharing the gospel the right way. And I'm a very logical person. Doesn't it make sense to do this? But what you're seeing before your eyes is a hard heart of unbelief that should grip you. It should be gut wrenching. Are there people in your life right now who, you know, they're rejecting forgiveness of their sin? They're choosing to live in guilt and does that strike you? Why would they live that way? The, the promise of the gospel is that we will be raised from our coffins and we would have hope in death. Why would someone walk through this life in guilt and no hope in death? Why would they reject the gospel? Does that shake you? It shakes the Savior. Why would someone choose to spend eternity alienated from God? Or maybe you're here today and it's you. It's you who the Savior looks down upon and marvels at. The, the gospel is right up under your nose. And you won't believe it. It's right in front of you in the pages of Scripture. You've heard it. You've sung it. You're around friends who believe it. And you won't believe. That, that amazes Jesus. That gets him. That, that shakes him, that you would live in guilt, that you would choose hopelessness, that, that you would choose hell. Jesus doesn't get it. Emotionally, there's an emotional response with Jesus. We see it when he looks down upon the city and he sees uh, his people who are like sheep without a shepherd. And he has this vomitous compassion. Why? Why does this happen? Why does unbelief exist? It moves the Savior. I wonder if it moves you. Or you just go through the motions. I do the Christian thing. I say the Christian thing. 
But then all around you are people who are dying and going to hell, rejecting the gospel. Does it shake you? You know, something else that amazes, causes the Savior to marvel today is the unbelief of many Christians here today. Those of you who are here today and you believe in Jesus. You are trusting in his cross as best you can. You believe he was righteous. You believe he was raised from the dead. You have said my eternal kingdom is heaven. And yet there are times in your life where you choose not to believe it. There are moments where you doubt it. Do you know in those moments Jesus says, what in the world are you doing? Cross, empty tomb, the promise of scripture. It blows the Savior away that you would re- that, that you would doubt those things. He's not mad at you. He's not irritated with you. He's not frustrated with you. But it does cause him to marvel. What's the solution? Belief. Trust. Don't doubt. Remember last week, do not fear, only believe, trust in the gospel, run to Jesus, bow to him. He is your hope. He is your salvation. He is your righteousness. He is your forgiveness. He is your mercy. Cling to him and reject your unbelief. And notice verse seven, he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over clean spirits. Now, we talked about the twelve earlier in Mark and Just in choosing this ragtag group, Jesus is executing judgment on the religious system. There are no rabbis here. There are no priests here in the twelve. It's as if Jesus is saying, well, y'all have a problem with me? This hillbilly from Nazareth declaring the kingdom? Wait till you see these guys. Fishermen, farmers, tax collectors, outcasts. Normal men with flaws. He, he, he sends out the twelve as an insult on the kingdom. And notice he sends them out two by two. Why does he do that? I know there's a cute song about that. But he sends them out two by two because it was two or three witnesses confirms their testimony. And so they were testifying. They were witnessing Jesus as Lord. And so there was two of them. And he gives them authority. The same authority that he possessed. Power to... To cast out demons, to heal the sick. And Mark mentions casting out demons and unclean spirits a lot because he wants to remind us of this clash, cosmic clash of kingdoms. You have the kingdom of God clashing with the kingdom of Satan. And it happens through the proclamation of the kingdom, the proclamation of the word of God. But notice what he does. Verse eight. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except their staff. No bread. No bag of money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter into a house, stay there until you depart from there. Now he commands them and he commands them. You're not going to take out any missionary support. There will be no fundraising, no ends of the earth offering. No, you're going to go out preaching the gospel pretty Much without anything, just the clothes on your back. Don't even take an extra coat for when it gets dark. You take a staff, there are going to be scorpions, there's going to be snakes, there are going to be things. You're going to need your staff to get get around, but it's pretty much the clothes on your back. And you're going to depend on the hospitality of others. Now we have to remember hospitality was such a part of this culture. You would go into towns and you would meet people for the first time and they would say, why don't y'all come over for dinner? Won't y'all stay a while? And it wasn't just a few hours. It was like a few weeks. Hey, won't y'all stay a while? I know in the South we say that just, you know, out of respect. It's just a nice thing we say. If you said, why don't y'all stay a while in this culture? People would say, okay, where's our beds? That's the way it worked. And that's how they were to to depend uh, upon the culture as they did ministry. And you have to remember, they were followers of Jesus. And so they enter these towns and people are going to say, hey, aren't you followers of Jesus? We want to know more about him. We know he's not with you. Now we can get all the secrets. Come on in and stay with us a while. But why weren't they allowed to take anything? And why did they have to stay in one house? Well, as miracle workers, the potential to be corrupted was massive. 
Here, Jesus is protecting them against the health, wealth, prosperity gospel. The gospel ain't for sale. And so you ain't going to take anything. You're not even going to take a bag of money to, so people can't pay you to preach the gospel. They can't pay you to perform miracles. You're not even going to take anything to put the money in. This is what we used to tell our kids when we go to the grandparents' house. Don't take anything that you can bring anything back with. And we would call them ahead of time at Christmas and say, we have a really small car. So gift cards is all you can give them. You will not corrupt them. You will not buy their love over Christmas. We don't have enough room for it. Well, here the the disciples are going in. They, They don't have, there's no way they can collect treasures for preaching the gospel. They can't even take a bag for the money. The kingdom can't be bought. And they're to stay at one place. Do not travel from house to house to house selling the kingdom. No, you preach the kingdom. You display the power of the kingdom. And notice as the text continues, verse 11. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet, shake it off as a testimony against them. And this was another cultural practice. When a Jew left a Gentile city, they would shake the dust off their feet to declare that city is unclean. That city is full of unclean dogs and Gentiles. And here Jesus says, on your mission, when you when people don't believe the message, you are to declare those people are unclean. And think about the place they just left. His hometown. When they don't believe in the Messiah, even if it's in your hometown, you declare they are unclean and unbelief. And we see that Paul did this. Remember, Paul preached Christ in the synagogue and was rejected. And what did he do when he got outside? He shook the dust off of his clothes to say these people rejected the Messiah. They are unclean. Now, this kind of blows our mind. But literally, Jesus is saying in the most biblical sense When your message is rejected, you are to say to hell with this place. I know we like to cavalierly say that trite ways. This was a part of their mission. And it was to grip them. That it was to shake them the same way that you are to declare these Gentile cities full of pagans, are unclean. Now you go into the city and even the Jews, even your friends, even the family you grew up with, when they reject the gospel, you are to say they are unclean in their unbelief and they are headed to judgment. Now, I don't think that's something you should say or do at Cracker Barrel this week. When your friend doesn't believe the gospel, you just get up and walk out and shake your feet off as you walk out the door. I don't think that's the point, but I do think the point is for anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus, you are to be okay with sorrow in your heart, looking them in the eyes and saying, you know, you're going to spend eternity in hell. You know, you know, that's what's coming when you reject this message. You see, our our favorite verse or the culture's favorite verse is thou shall not judge. Jesus was okay with judging unbelief. And he taught his disciples to do it. Jesus pointed to Sire and Titan and said it is going to be more tolerable than Sodom and Gomorrah for those cities. The fire that rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, that's nothing compared to the judgment coming. These places. Jesus would say of. People in places that rejected him, they are like dogs that return to their own vomit. He would say, do not cast your pearls before swine, filthy, vicious animals who reject the gospel. That should startle us. That should shake us. But what Jesus is getting at is unbelief is real and unbelief should shake you. And you've got to be okay at times with staring unbelief in the eyes and warning, warning with tears in your eyes. This is what is coming. This is this is what will happen if you reject the Savior. And notice what they did. They went out and proclaimed that people should repent. They should turn from the judgment that's coming. 
And they cast out many demons and they anoint it with oil. This was symbolic of the kingdom. And they healed many who were sick with them. Now, what Jesus warns us in this section of Scripture is, first of all, unbelief is tragic and it should shake us. It should shake us. And we should warn those who do not believe in Jesus of the judgment that they are in right now. The wrath abides upon them. But as Jesus sends out his disciples, he tells them unbelief is to be expected. And it should not deter you. In this section in the book of Matthew, Matthew 16, he tells his disciples, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. And the wolves were the Jewish elite, the rabbis, the religious of the day. They are the wolves that are going to devour you and try to kill you. And if they hated me, they will hate you. The truth here is Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. And Jesus is telling his disciples, if you preach and you witness the kingdom, this unbelief is going to bubble up before your eyes. You see, we can keep the gospel bland. You can keep the gospel bland and you can make it about coming to church and you can make it about. I don't even know what this means now. Winning. That's like a Christian thing. Now we're going to win. I don't know what we're, we're going to win. Jesus won. We're going to win what he's purchased for us, I guess. I don't know how I'm going to win at work this week. That's just a thing. That's kind of a soapbox. Just forget that part of the sermon. But we can make it about all of these silly, generic, bland things. And people will like us. And they will pat us on the back. And they will smile at us. And they would say, you're doing just a you're doing just a great thing. I'm so happy for you. You're a part of such a good thing. And it's so good for you. But when you start looking people in the eyes and say, no. No. If you do not believe in Jesus and follow him, the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of your own mind. You'll spend eternity in hell. You start saying that and it's like peroxide on a wound. Unbelief just starts bubbling up and people get irritated because, you know, we want Jesus to be who we want him to be. And we want the gospel to be what we want it to be. And so when you start preaching the Jesus of the Bible, people who come in and say, well, I want Jesus to be a politician who just affirms my political leanings and values and platform. And you start saying, no, Jesus is king of the cosmos. He's king of all people, people from every tribe, every tongue, every race that he shed his blood for. And his kingdom will transcend this country. His kingdom will transcend send all nations you start really preaching that people get a little frustrated they get a little irritated you start talking to people about taking up your cross and following jesus as lord and king and people who wanted jesus just to be a life coach who tells them they're good and they can do anything that they want to do and he wants them safe secure hashtag blessed hashtag thankful hashtag hashtag You start telling me, no, 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 it's taking up your cross and suffering and loving your enemies and blessing those who persecute you and forgiving your worst enemy as God has forgiven. You start preaching those things and people get a little irritated. You can't keep the gospel bland. And as long as you keep the gospel bland, you'll never see unbelief. But you begin to preach the gospel and you're going to see it clearly. You see, sometimes preachers are welcomed in their hometown. That does happen. But the problem with the Nazareth elite is they weren't looking at Jesus going, we can't believe in him because he's too much like us. That's not what they were saying. They were saying we can't believe in him because he's nothing like us. Think about that. We can't trust him. He can't be our king because he's not like us. They wanted a hometown Messiah who just played on their team. And that's not who Jesus was. He came to the Jew first and then the Gentile. And they thought they were more like God than Jesus. They thought they were a better savior than Jesus. And maybe that's your problem today. You you hear the gospel and you look in the mirror. And you, you see a reflection of what you think is goodness and power 
and you see the way that you've ordered your life and, and, and you think you know what is going to bring you pleasure and happiness and joy. And you hear the gospel and you look in the mirror and say, he's nothing like us. So how can he save us? Well, it's good news today that Jesus is nothing like you. He is God's fullness in flesh and blood nailed to a bloody cross raised from the dead. And he is your only hope. And maybe there in the mirror, it's the wrong prophet that's welcomed in your own town. 